I'm Ashley Zielinski. Welcome to Unfolding the Universe First Light. Um, this is my solo exhibition, uh, which was a uh, collaboration between uh, myself and then some uh, scientists at NASA Goddard um, and the James Webb Space Telescope team. Oh, light, thank you. There we go. <laughs> um, so yeah, usually in this main gallery space, we have uh, five sculptures that are 3D printed and plated in various metals. Um, the sculptures, the screen prints, the holograms, and almost everything you're seeing in the gallery today was created since uh, July 12th when the first images were released from the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, I've been working with the James Webb Space Telescope team for seven years now. Um, back in 2016, I had the honor of seeing the telescope while it was still on Earth uh, in a clean room at NASA Goddard. Um, and then I created, after that, meeting the scientists that day and seeing the telescope, I created the gold piece with the arms coming out of it, exploration. Um, and that was shown at the NASA Goddard Visitor Center for a while um, in 2017. And yeah, so since then I've been uh, working with the scientists. We created Unfolding the Universe, uh, a VR ex web experience, uh, which is the, the virtual reality piece that you guys can try after the talk. Um, that piece was created in collaboration with 12 other scientists uh, working on web. Um, uh, during the pandemic, I uh, interviewed all of the scientists on the team um, and did portraiture of them, and then I worked with uh, Pierre Francois from Taxi Studio, and we created this virtual world where you could walk up to these portraits and hear a little bit about the interview um, and learn about the telescope and learn about the scientists and the humans behind Webb. And what prompted all of this VR stuff was we were in a we were in a pandemic and we couldn't hang out together, and NASA was uh, having trouble reaching out, doing public relations, and, and sharing the project with people. You know in their own home. So we decided to do something in VR, and I had never done anything in VR, so it was uh, a whole new world for me. Um, so this is my first virtual reality uh, artwork. Um, and then since then, since the first images came out, we created a second virtual reality world of the Cartwheel Galaxy, which you can also see in the, on the computers over here. Um, yeah, so basically, we, we just wanted to commemorate the launch of the James Webb Space Telescope with that work and the humans behind it, and we wanted to reach as many people as possible. Um, and that's why we reached out to Mozilla Hubs, because their VR platform is extremely democratic. You don't need a headset. Uh, you can do it on your browser, mobile, um, desktop, whatever. Um, and so it was able to, be, to reach as many people as, as we could. So NASA was tweeting out these events. We were hosting these events in VR with the scientists where they would come as a little avatar and give a talk virtually with a, you know, a PowerPoint behind them just in, like in real life, but you were just in a, in a VR world. Um, and we ran these events for a few months leading up to the first images. Um, and it was a great way to yeah, reach the public when we weren't allowed out. Um, but yeah, the James Webb Space Telescope was launched on Christmas Day of uh, 2021. And uh, we have held a launch party in VR um, and got to watch the launch with some of the scientists uh, in the virtual space. And yeah, and so since then, since uh, July 12th, I've been working with the same scientists and uh, making all the work for this show. We have the silk screen room. Um, that was in collaboration with the Space Telescope Science Institute. So they are actually the people that process the raw data from web and turn them into the images. Um, and they were here last week giving a talk. Um, yeah, and so we, that, what inspired that was as the data is coming down, they do different exposures of different wavelengths um, with using the telescope, and then they, they sandwich them together digitally. Um, and I thought this process seemed a lot like the silk screening process, where you take, you take each color channel and you layer it. So I asked them very nicely to 
undo all the hard work they had done and give me the original four um, exposure, exposure photos, and uh, I made silk screens out of them and then layered them together. So that's the, the silk screens that you're seeing in that room. Um, and then the light bright uh, is a great illustration of what a deep field is. So the Hubble was the original deep field photographer. Um, so years ago, they pointed the Hubble telescope at a dark spot in the sky and did a long exposure where they thought there was no light. Um, and this was seen as extremely risky behavior because it's a considered a, like could have been a waste of telescope time. Um, but instead, it was this amazing revelation of like, wow, even in the darkest spots in the sky, we're still finding light, we're still finding stars, we're still finding galaxies. Um, and so the first image from Webb that was released by Biden on July 11th um, was this same image. They pointed the Webb telescope at the exact same spot as the Hubble. And we found even more things, because it's an even more power to powerful telescope. So we saw even more stars, even more galaxies. And the light bright is just an illustration of if we looked at that spot even longer uh, with the James Webb Space Telescope, where would we find even more stars and galaxies? So you're asked to take a light bright peg and put it in a spot in the sky that's dark and imagine there being a star there, because there probably is. Um, and the web, the web deep field was only eight hours of exposure and the, the Hubble one was two weeks. So at some point, I know it's in the schedule at some point, that they're going to point the Webb telescope at that deep field spot again, but for a longer period of time. So we'll see what they find. Um, and then we have these amazing holograms over here, done by my amazing assistant Tess, uh, of the Stefan's Quintet, this galaxy cluster that's smashing into itself. So all of the, all of the galaxies are spinning and hurtling towards each other and tearing each other apart. Um, but in a beautiful dance. Uh, <laughs> so we have, this, we have these uh, galaxies uh, laid out, the holograms are laid out in the formation of the galaxy cluster. Um, and yeah, beautifully animated by Tess. And she's going to tell us all about it on the panel today. Um, so yeah, uh, I'm going to introduce uh, the moderator of our panel now, my brother, Jimmy Zielinski. Uh, and he's going to introduce our, our distinguished panelists. And they're going to tell you all about the tech that went into unfolding the universe first light. So, Jimmy? Hey everyone, uh, I'm Jimmy. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Ashley. Um, today I'm going to be moderating a panel, and this panel is going to be on the technology behind the art pieces that you will see uh, installed in this, uh, this exhibit. Um, we have a variety of people contributing to this panel, so we have both creatives and the folks behind the actual technology that the creatives are le uh, leveraging to produce the art that you'll see today. Um, Without further ado, I'm going to invite to the stage uh, John Shaughnessy, who is the Manager of Engineering and Ecosystem Strategy at Mozilla Hubs, which is the virtual reality platform um, that uh, you'll see inside the headset and projected then on this display after the panel. Um, so, uh, um, Also in the VR space, we have Pierre-Francois Gerard, who uh, works at Metaxu Studios. He is the co-founder and director there, and he has done a lot of the content creation around the VR uh, experience that you've seen in VR, or will see uh, after this panel. <laughs> we have uh, Tess, who is uh, Ashley's studio assistant, who has worked on um, the holograms uh, uh, on the displays that you'll find in the room uh, next to us. Um, Tess specializes in 3D design and animation and interactive experiences, um, and she'll talk about how she um, actually created the content behind the 3D imaging. Uh, Tess. And finally, we have Dario Laverde, who is the Director of Developer Relations at HTC. Um, HTC is the manufacturer of the VR display that you put on your head and uh, explore in virtual reality. Um, in this installation, so, Jerry. All right, um, I figure as 
uh, first question, we're gonna just do a little bit of an icebreaker. I, uh, I kind of got to give everyone a little bit of background for um, everyone's roles, but I'm curious to hear um, how you guys necessarily landed in those roles. What, what brought you to this point uh, in your career? So I figure this is a question for everyone, so we'll just go down the line, starting with you, John. Sure, so um, uh, what brought me to here? I think, uh, so I manage engineering and ecosystem strategy at Mozilla Hubs, and I think it combines two of my interests. The first being, I'm kind of uh, obsessed with how computers mediate communication between people. Um, I'm, I'm sort of looking out at the room and noticing that anytime this number of people get together, uh, things start to happen that can't happen on video calls or any other medium online where, uh, sure, there's one conversation going on now, but uh, a moment ago before we started, there were probably 20 conversations in this room happening simultaneously. Um, so the engineering behind the virtual venue of Mozilla Hubs is what kind of uh, drives the engineering half of my brain. And then uh, building things out in the open and getting out, getting software out to as many people as possible, um, building in uh, systems in a decentralized way is the sort of other half of my brain where uh, we're trying to give tools out to an ecosystem of builders, of creatives, of event hosts, uh, well, like, like the event hosts putting this on. Um, and that's sort of the ecosystem development side of my, my job and uh, of my interests. Jimmy, we have an additional to the panel. Yeah. Uh, sorry about that. We have a late addition <laughs> to the <laughs> panelist crew here. Uh, we have Nikki, who is representing Looking Glass. So this is the technology behind the holographic displays. Um, whereas Tess um, is the content creator for the content running on the displays, Nikki is going to be representing the, uh, the actual display itself, the technology behind that. Is this on? Yes. So what John says resonates quite, uh, quite a bit with me, but I'm approaching this from a very different background. I've studied architecture, um, but I was always uh, thinking about how we can use space and the, the, the skills of the architect to create those 3D graphic interface back in the 90s um, for the cyberspace uh, and, and, and yeah, obviously virtual reality world to, yeah, to bring people together to communicate, to use this computer as an interface between people, between data and, and, and people and how we can uh, use, make good use of all this uh, technology. So. That's what I've been doing. I've been very patient because I've done a lot of 3D visualization for uh, 10, 15 years, doing off, uh, off, offline uh, rendering, um, being yeah, very patient for the first uh, VR headset, affordable VR headset coming in, in 2012, and then uh, decided uh, it was time to really dig a bit further into that. So I did a whole PhD. Uh, trying to come up with uh, some kind of framework to really use architecture skill to create those virtual environment and in a sense that it's useful for people and, and, and it can be um, it can help them to support them the, the communication it can help them to perform better to learn skills better to train better so I've tried all this kind of, uh, of different use case of uh, VR and ended up with uh, working with Mozilla for the last two years now, because of its accessibility and it's yeah easy, uh, like you can really pretty quickly prototype and put things out and test that test it with people, uh, and that's yeah that's the only thing that matters is if people don't use it then why why are we doing this? Yeah. Hello, um, I'm Nikki. I'm a graphic designer. I've been doing this for Hello. Hi everyone, I'm Dario. Um, 
So I, I started at HTC, I guess almost a dozen years ago. Um, I was there when we were doing uh, mobile phones, Android phones, and then I, my first ex, uh, VR experience was at Valve's headquarters, and we became partners, and we released one of the first uh, PC consumer-facing uh, devices, uh, which by Pro, which you'll see, is, is what that's being used here, is one of the latest iterations of the PC version. Um, I brought with me also a the Vive Focus 3, which is our uh, all-in-one, high-end all-in-one. Um, and I actually tested this piece just before coming on here, and it's great to see it working out of the box. I hadn't tested before that. Um, and yeah, I'm pretty excited about where we are with uh, how XR has come along. And uh, we're, we're quite, it's great to be here to support. I don't know if this works. Oh, it doesn't. <laughs> uh, so introductions. <laughs> Sorry, I missed that. Uh, I'm Nikki. I lead the customer experience and community teams here at Looking Glass. I want to thank Ashley and also Tess for helping create content for our holographic displays. Um, our company, Looking Glass, uh, we've been around since 2014 and our mission was really to chase the dream of the hologram. And in 2020, we launched our flagship product, Looking Glass Portrait which is the one you see on that gallery wall over there with the five uh, 3D visualizations of Stefan's quintet. Um, and yeah, we're, we're really excited obviously to be here to represent a new medium uh, that can be you know, sh used by artists um, as well as other, uh, other people as well. That's sort of uh, what makes the technology really exciting is that we're really still trying to shape uh, who uses uh, these interfaces. Um, obviously, hopefully in the future, everyone uses these interfaces, but I'm really excited that um, it's being used in to represent the universe and our galaxies, which is obviously very three-dimensional, um, and it just seems like the appropriate way to show it. All right, thanks everyone. Um, I figure since we kind of have this dichotomy on uh, our panel, between kind of the content creators and the technology um, creators, um, I kind of wanted to start with the content creators and ask you, um, in your own words, for maybe those that haven't seen the pieces, um, describe the work that you've created and kind of like your process and how you thought about creating it. Um, and then we can actually see what the technologists think of that. Did you do it the right way? Is that how they intended, <laughs> right? Um, so this is largely a question. First, uh, I want to start with Pierre, and then we can go to Tess after that. Um, so, for this project, there were two main worlds. The, if I start with the, 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 the process was different for, for two worlds. So the first one, it was um, Sky, we call it Sky. And the second one is Cartwheel. Um, so for Sky, it was, yeah, as uh, Ashley explained, it was during the lockdown. So uh, she had already done the, the sculpture uh, that I was finally happy to see. Uh, for real, uh, the, the three arms one, the gold one, um, and so the idea was, okay, we she she made that sculpture, but how do we how do we make it available like in, in a virtual world? Um, and so we, and th there was an animation already, the idea of an animation, and so yeah, so partly was uh, well first the the, the 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 piece was made for three D printing, so the first thing was to optimize it for the web. <laughs> And that's still uh, still tricky. It's still pretty heavy uh, because so many details in the and, and we're losing a little bit of the detail in the in the three D environment. So a lot of optimization. That's the words gonna come a lot of my mouth, I suppose. But that's part of the of the game of using the web. Um, use yeah Blender and uh, so that's for the, the the sculpture for the the environment itself. We we using this uh, point cloud uh, method. It's done in Blender. Uh, in, um, sorry, it's done in Rhino, and so it's yeah, it's kind of a, an inversion of the of a three D scan. Uh, you create a surface and then you make it in a point cloud, and that goes not directly into hubs. Uh, we upload it on. Uh, I don't know how much technical can we. Are people happy to have like technical detail? 
in here, or um, I don't know yes. how much. Yeah. I'd assume that the the tech folks here okay, okay, okay. are uh, are definitely yeah. going to wish everyone is very technical. <laughs> okay. So so yeah, I mean it's not that technical. It's just we upload the the point cloud on Sketchfab um, actually, and then from there we bring it into Spoke that loads it into apps. Uh, so that's of a, a strange um, workflow, but it works pretty well. Um, and and then yeah, I mean it's so many so many common, and I can I can talk for quite a while here. The the soundscape is done by an artist uh, specifically for that space as well. So if you move around, you have different. Uh, Different way of perceiving the sound, it, 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 which is specialized. So the the the, uh, Jue, the artist, uh, is an opera singer, uh, and he created the piece for that particular space, uh, which is already uh, extraordinary. And then the, the 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 sound from the the scientist, the extract from the interview that we place in front of each of these portraits uh, that Ashley has drawn, uh, and then we use uh, the um, sound box. I don't know what's the exact name. Audio, Audio zone. There we go. Thank you. Audio <laughs> zone. So that we, when you get close to the portrait, the the sound, you can hear the sound. Actually, the sound runs all the time. That's some, maybe some challenge there. Um, and uh, yeah, so that that's for that world. For cartwheel, it was more uh, creative. We start actually to think about that with you, um, and and thinking how we can um, make it like a as a 360 video originally, but hubs, I mean hubs, web, the WebGL and, and the web doesn't, well, actually, usually in VR, in general, I would say that the 360 videos are pretty heavy uh, uh, format uh, for VR in general. And so we actually went, tried to find some other uh, other option to, to, to render this cartridge galaxy in, uh, in, in hubs, and yeah, we, we create a 3D animation with an object and apply some of the texture that you created on these uh, with some transparency and and it works pretty well I think uh, and the bond cloud was yeah similar uh, to that so but maybe yeah the transition to you with with this amazing image you created uh, I think in Houdini um, I use Blender for all of the galaxies. Um, I, my main contributions um, were the galaxies that you see um, on the holographic displays as well as in the VR environments. Um, and kind of what Pierre was talking about briefly was how we initially wanted to do a um, 360 video within one of the VR worlds of a galaxy that's beneath you that's rotating. Um, but because of limitations, you know, it is more difficult to be, you know, displaying a video mm -hmm. on the web. Um, so we made some workarounds and instead um, rendered out the different layers of a still image of a galaxy, which uh, Pierre was then able to rotate and animate in um, the VR environment, which achieved a very similar effect, so that was a nice creative um, solution. Um, it's actually, it, it actually bring even a better perspective, because if you have 360 video, it's flat around you. Mm, yeah. But applying it on, on those discs, you actually see the, the arms of the galaxy going yeah. away. So it had some benefits as well to that. Um, for my process of creating the galaxies in general that you see, holograms. Um, I use Blender. Um, you know, a very similar process to just creating uh, an animation regularly and designing that. Um, I did use um, shaders for a lot of what you see because um, just it's easier for the computer to process and then to render out um, many frames when it's not, uh, you're not using meshes, but you're using um, just materials. Um, so once I had all of that set up and I had the galaxies, you know, moving as, you know, they should and having the coloring that's all based on the original images um, that NASA took of Stevens Quintet, then I, 
um, use some of Looking Glass's plugins. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that pretty much just made it um, easy for me to replace Blender's 3D camera with Looking Glass's 3D camera. And um, the render output ended up being um, different. You know, it captures multiple angles of the 3D scene, not just one. So that allows it to be viewed in multiple angles. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's essentially the same as creating an animation once you have that different outputted footage. And then you sequence it and turn it into a video, and Looking Glass runs it pretty smoothly. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and it sounds like both of you and your experience working on these different platforms, these new cutting edge platforms, you've kind of had to adapt what you have previously understood as um, how to model things. Um, in this case, they actually both happen to be 3D, um, 3D spaces. Um, was there any takeaway that you got at the end of that experience that was like kind of eye-opening towards, um, you learned a new new tool, something that like maybe you wouldn't have been pushed uh, pushed into unless you had the constraints of the new platform that you're adopting. So that's still Pierre and Tess. Um. Yeah, no, definitely. <clears throat> I think constraints are good. Um, working in the digital realm, sometimes we, we thought there is no more constraint. We can do anything, everything. And yeah, that doesn't work like that. So, um, yeah, no, I think it's, it's good to have those constraints. And actually, I think Hubs is doing, you no. Know, they are publishing quite a few good articles on on very various technique we can use to to uh, yeah to make very beautiful render and animation and brings these worlds to life with with different method that actually exist since we start to create video games um, and we sometimes think like people are forgetting about this this technique uh, it just maybe jump into Unreal and think everything is possible. Um, which is, yeah, it's not the case. So yeah, the, the work with constraints, um, work around, find different methods to, 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 uh, to attain the, the, the objective you want to attain. I think it's definitely uh, something we need to keep doing. I, um, can, can you hold the mic up yeah. to your mouth? Is this okay? Yeah. yeah, we just want to make sure for the recording um, before I can hear. I definitely prepared. Um, to troubleshoot early on uh, because there were issues. Um, like, I think what is amazing about Looking Glass is your community and the resources online that your community has to help people debug and solve problems. Um, so I was having issues rendering out um, the animation and this is a very long animation each each video is like 2500 frames and um, you know for each frame there's like 45 different angles within it so it's essentially like 45 frames in a frame um, so my computer just kept crashing and apparently this was a normal thing um, but there was some amazing member of your your community that like came up with a GitHub like code that you run on your computer's terminal mm -hmm. and it just fixed all of it. Um, but you know, I needed to leave that amount of time ahead mm -hmm. to figure out those issues. Um, and similarly, when with you know, we currently don't have it installed right now, but um, for the opening, we had a 16 inch looking glass um, that was displaying an interactive experience that you could um, move your hands around and have it affect the galaxies um, in the screen. Um, and that one as well required a lot of troubleshooting and realizing that some of these resources that have been available online to help get you know, hand tracking working, or, you know, all these things were outdated, and, um, yeah, it's realizing the limitations 
and then working around it and um, just adjusting the project to what is feasible and what will ultimately look good and make a good experience as a whole. So it sounds like Looking Glass has a really great community that can help you solve your problems. Uh, Nikki, um, that kind of leads into a really good question for you. Um, at Looking Glass, clearly you have to prioritize and actually building out that community and helping people. What, what initiatives do you have at Looking Glass for artists and um, kind of other non-commercial um, experiences? Sure. Um, yeah, I would say, first of all, filing a bug report. <laughs> <laughs> Duncan over there is, uh, he needs our creative tools team. Um, but yeah, I think from the very get-go since we launched um, our very first displays, even back in 2018, our first dev kits, we really prioritized building up a community of people who were not just interested in looking glass, but we really want to try to bring together people who are generally really interested in 3D as a, you know, just as a theme. And so you get people who are into Blender, and, you know, use Unity, use Unreal, maybe they just like to take stereo photos, um, and really trying to bring that group of people together. So we, you know, obviously before the pandemic, we did a ton of events. Uh, we hosted events in our, in our Greenpoint office um, here, here in New York. Um, and we also, you know, traveled to the places that our communities were. We had actually had a really big community, or we do still have a really big community in Japan. <laughs> and so once a year we'd go there, or you know, a few times a year we'd go to Japan. They formed their own looking glass club there and uh, without us planned their own hackathons and study groups. And that was really awesome to see. Um, and then over time, obviously, as we had to move online, um, we built up our Discord community, which currently is active today, um, look.glass slash Discord, <laughs> um, if you're interested. And, you know, we will host challenges, AMAs, um, online events, and yeah, really just trying to bring together a, a, a lot of people who probably would not have had a space to talk to each other, if not for kind of being joined by, um, I guess, their interest in, you know, potentially seeing their work in a holographic display. So, yeah, thank you, Tess, and I'm just glad someone was able to help you. <laughs> awesome. So it sounds like Looking Glass is really looking into, pun not intended, um, kind of expanding their audience and making sure that uh, kind of people can experiment with the technology. Um, have you, where, where do you see Looking Glass going in the next few years? Do you see some crossover um, between kind of like the VR or XR space and uh, the holograms? Because um, correct me if I'm wrong, with no. the stereoscopic imagery, you use that in both, both devices, right? Um, yeah, actually that's a great question. <laughs> um, because I think, you know, over the years we have realized that A, like we're not, like AR, VR, they shouldn't be seen as competitors to um, a looking glass display. Actually, once upon a time, our co-founder once kind of compared this to like VR to scuba diving, where you know you really want to be immersed in everything. And once you gear up, it's great, but it takes quite a while to like gear up. AR kind of like snorkeling, where you still have to put on glasses, but it's kind of less immersive as scuba diving. And a holographic display is kind of just like swimming. It's there, you don't really have to like pay attention to it, and you're just like, you know, kind of paddling in the water. Um, so I really think, especially like as evident in a lot of these, you know, installations here, that the same thing can be represented in different formats. So you can get the immersion of a, a VR headset. Um, and I think one thing that we realized um, over the years that really connects and, and we want to make it easier and more accessible for people to share and consume content. Earlier this year, we launched something called Blocks, which um, is a way to, to pull in maybe like a, a static frame of your um, content and pretty soon video onto the web. So we really think that the web is going to soon be a way for people to consume, share um, content across devices. So. It'll take me a while to get too much into this, but um, yeah, we really think that uh, with something, you know, with pulling 
that content into the web via right now the browser is really a way to, to kind of cross over um, content through looking glass displays, other holographic displays, AR and VR headsets alike. So yeah, we're really excited. We're actually launching something next week that is web related. So definitely. We'll, we'll I'm just telling you to follow web, us, right? join our Discord, and all that stuff. So. <laughs> you, you can look out for that on the web, right? Um, so the, the web seems like a pretty um, cross-cutting technology here. Uh, we have Mozilla on the board. They're, um, they're definitely like champions of the free web. Um, so I kind of have a question for John and Dario. Um, the, the, as the web just continues to expand and eat the world, um, where do you see your technologies fitting in? Um, how are those fundamental technologies developing? Um, and how are, how are they helping you access uh, the communities you're trying to build? John? Sure. Um, so I think something that the web enables that people don't maybe immediately think of is this idea of permissionless innovation. Um, in order to join the vast network of the internet on the web, you um, register your domain name with, uh, uh, with a registrar, and then you run a web server, and then you're serving any application to anyone in the world who can connect to your web server. Um, and the web, you know, it, it started as a, a sort of information sharing system at CERN. Like Tim Berners-Lee had the idea that, um, hey, I've like created for myself this, you know, notebook in my computer, and I've linked the notes together. Everyone at CERN should do this. It was like from a, 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 a scientific community, and uh, you should be able to edit it right there and and, and link them together. And um, well, it's been close to 30 years since then, and maybe maybe past 30 years since then. And we've added the ability for anyone using the web to uh, talk to each other in real time like a phone call, uh, spin up video calls like you would do in Zoom or Skype or, or Teams. We can render 3D worlds using the, uh, the graphics acceleration of uh, graphics cards. There are wonderful VR headsets with browsers built into them so that uh, anyone can participate in this network. Um, and I think mm, for me, it, it makes a difference when, uh, like th this experience is not running on uh, mozilla.com. This is, this is your own website. You have the direct relationship with consumers. I think that's important. Um, I'm kind of losing my train of thought here, so <laughs> maybe I'm going to hand it over to sure. Aria, who, who works a lot on the, who knows about rendering the web in a browser and, and yes, so so yeah, but uh, Mozilla and HTC have been partners. Um, uh, you may have heard of the Firefox Reality browser, um, and it was just great to work with you guys to make this happen on our devices. Again, just to step back, I think I think VR, as you know, uh, from coming from PC. There's several platforms we didn't really cover, like a basic intro, but um, with WebXR, uh, that's the, the, the common denominator for, for distribution and discovery. And, and as you mentioned, it's just a, a great way for someone to self, um, self host. And I think that's, it's all about open standards. And we're working very closely with uh, not just WebXR, but OpenXR, uh, which is the standard for uh, cross device portability. Even, even for the PC and other platforms and mobile. Um, but, uh, and even Web, WebXR uses OpenXR at a lower level as well. And so, it, so the, the, the exciting thing is that it's open standards, it's open source. Firefox Reality is an open source project. It did not die. It was just reborn because people took that source as it was. And, and now there's a new, uh, a new branding called Bulvik and uh, we, we just launched the very latest version on our devices. And uh, it's just pretty exciting to see that literally from one, the last version of Firefox Reality to, to the very first version of Wolfpack is just a continuous thing thanks to open source developers. Um, and it's pretty exciting to see that, that move ahead in an open way. So I think that's why we chose the web for, um, for supporting the web for a lot of want to say the word, you'll probably say it next. <laughs> the metaverse. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
That's a great time to ask. What is the metaverse? Uh, how does that tie into all of this? Um, uh, do you want to take that? Uh, sure. Uh, so, so it's 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 kind of the way to think of it. It's like it's always kind of been with us. It's the, the next iteration of the internet itself, um, and, and the way I see um, the way websites proliferated the internet, um, the World Wide Web. Um, the same thing that's happening with, with virtual worlds or spaces. Uh, within the metaverse. Um, so we're pretty excited because obviously a, a, a virtual world is 3D. And we have the XR expertise and background with our devices. We're going to embrace that and make sure that we're uh, ready to, to help creators and users create spaces of their own on, on the metaverse. Um, we, have, we have our own branding, Viverse, which is really just um, a place that we can have creators and users have their own spaces in. You can think of it as a portal as well, or a, a discovery point for, for uniting all these worlds, again, using open standards. Awesome. Um, so in adopting all these open standards, uh, have you found any additional difficulties? Like, what, what comes with adopting those standards? What um, that, like, does that further complicate things? Does that simplify things? What has been your experience kind of going all in on democratization of these technologies? Um, well, it's a long process. Um, right now, a, a, a large group of us decided to, to join the Metaverse Standards uh, Forum so we can discuss what standards we still need to make. And so um, it's important to, to have this conversation now rather than wait to see what happens to make sure we can all, all, it's all about interoperability, and that's what I'm excited about, interoperability between, um, not just on, on the web, but also with native apps as well, and, and being able to, to cross that. It's a challenge, but the conversation is ongoing through all the major players, and we'll see. It's, it's hard to give a timeline, because again, it's like, when, when did the internet launch? How many websites did it take? <laughs> <laughs> so, I covered a great, uh, a great uh, side that not many people think about, which is like the social difficulty of like wrangling a whole bunch of people together to create standards and make sure that things are compatible and everyone is in agreement. Um, John, do you want to talk about a little bit of the technical difficulties in that space um, that you've had to deal with uh, developing the platform? Um, sure. So uh, there are certainly technical difficulties, especially if you know, let's say that we've implemented rendering of avatars in virtual worlds using a particular way to animate their arms and, and legs, although I think it's a meme at this point that you know, <laughs> virtual reality avatars don't tend to have legs. Um, and so you know, if a, a technical team has done work and made that uh, functional, and then they want to be compliant with a standard that didn't do it the same way, they've got to sort of back up and re-implement some things. Uh, but I think, that, I think that the social problems that Daria mentioned are much harder to tackle when these standards uh, bodies get together. I think that's not new. Like the, the internet um, has developed, there's the W3C and, um, oh gosh, I'm blanking on, uh, there's Kronos, there's a number of standards bodies that uh, get lo lots of organizations in a, in a big room together. And just like you're moderating this panel, the conversations at standard bodies are, are extremely structured because, uh, okay, here we have, uh, six people trying to kind of voice their opinion. Um, at these standards groups, there might be 50 people representing 30 companies who each have their own incentives. They're each trying to compete in a market at a different level. And they're trying to agree on, um, you know, is this something that we can agree to implement in a way that everyone can compete? Or there, there may be someone in the room who says, well, actually, you know, privately under NDA, I can't say this, we're trying to actually monopolize this space. We are not going to participate in the standards because this is where we want to remain competitive. So I think there are technical limitations, but the aligning incentives and uh, figuring out which, which areas of this sort of metaverse, or I like to call it the immersive web because I'm a kind of fan of uh, extending the internet rather than, okay, let's live our second life in the, in the virtual world. Um, an immersive web means that to me. Uh, yeah, th those social problems are much more difficult, sticky things to solve. And, and thinking about incentives and when you're signing up for a service, are, is the company building that technology aligning their incentives it, with me or with third parties who maybe want to uh, harvest my data or spy on what I'm doing in there? Um, 
to make one last point, uh, we have very talented artists on this panel, and they they ought to be able to distribute their work wherever there are audiences they want to reach. And I think um, that there are several platforms where that's not the case. If you if you distribute on their platform, they kind of take rights over that work. And I think this renewed interest in a metaverse and even some of the Web3 talk has uh, a lot of grifting and a lot of uh, uh, things you have to squint at and be like, what are they really talking about? But I think one theme is uh, artists having direct relationships with people who, who experience their work and having more of a say and more control over that data, being, having that data be portable uh, across the, the platforms that are just really intermediaries of connecting people together. So everything, at, oh, did, did you want to add anything to that, Daria? Yeah, I just wanted to, to, to give you some information what it's like firsthand. I attend the uh, OpenXR meetings weekly. We have 50 plus, that's a good guess, um, folks on those meetings, and, and that includes everybody, all the device manufacturers, uh, Unity, you know, Epic, um, WebXR as well. And it's happening, it's, we're constantly meeting. I mean, OpenXR is specific for developers across platforms on XR. But that ties in into WebXR, of course, into the uh, metaverse. And I don't think I have to worry about uh, legs anymore. I think they're they're here now. Uh, so so um, Viverse uh, is based a lot on the work for clubs, and um, yeah, we now provide an avatar creator that allows you to have all these choices. Um, so that's part of our our Vive solution, and it's all going to be about the tools really to make it easier for users to be creators. I think all users are creators. I think anyone who's, who's gone in, into a social VR and set up their avatar, you're creating. Um, and we want to make, create tools that make it easier to create your own world, so we'll, we're providing that as well. And, and it's just, just going to be a very creative time. Awesome. Well, no new technology is not without any hurdles in adoption and, and usage. Um, so uh, along that lines of thinking, uh, what is, having worked in this space now, each of you, um, the number one thing that you're most inspired by or looking forward to having um, having participated in some of this new cutting-edge 3D technology. Um, I figure we just start. Actually, let's start with Nikki and come back down this way. Let's mix it up. All right. Hey, guys. Um, I guess I am actually most excited about um, what y'all were just talking about, which is interoperability and being able to allow artists to not, like, free themselves free them from just creating art for a looking glass. You know, they should be able to create something where it can be experienced on the web, on a 2D display, as well as um, on a VR headset and an AR headset. Um, so that's kind of what, you know, where we're operating from, um, especially with uh, some of these announcements we have coming up. Um, and yeah, that's that's sort of where, where we see the most exciting, but definitely we should talk after. <laughs> Daria? Um, yeah, there's always going to be hurdles, but it's the exciting thing about being in tech. Um, and even if we make, I always tell developers to don't worry about obsoleting yourself by making tools that, that allow creators to bypass having to hire developers, because there's always going to be more things around the corner. Um, but it's going to get a lot easier. I mean, some of the things that were described about, you know, video versus, uh, you know, rendering in real time, that should go away. Uh, I think it's, there's going to be a lot of improvements um, that, that I'm seeing already with video and web. Um, but, I mean, you're always going to have a much higher uh, uh, rendering capabilities with a PC based locally. But even that's moving to the cloud. And so we're pretty excited seeing, you know, the best quality still being accessible by more people through the web. Yeah, but we definitely have some <coughs> still some issues with the 360 video. Uh, I mean, if you compare the two world um, that you can s see there, there is one 360 video actually in the sky world, um, and sadly, we can't jump into it, I'm just teasing my, uh, my friends here, we, for, for, for a couple of reasons we can't jump into it from the Vive in that 360 sphere. Um, 
don't have the, we don't have the, the space we'll button on the five, you know? We'll so, work on it. But you can access the 360 yeah, video on the, on the computer there. So I would, I would encourage you to have, have a go at the 360 video because then you get in, in a world into a world, which is pretty cool. Um, but it is, yeah, it, is, it makes the, the world heavy and probably if we try to get in that world, 10 of us, uh, the sound's gonna be creaky. Um, but you were asking about some exciting project um, or stuff. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, what is the most well, exciting thing you see coming? And so I'm working on with another um, new project where we we have built um, from my architecture background. We're building um, a hubs portal, and they are building a platform for WebXR that would connect all your world whatever WebXR platform they are host on. Um, so, like, because obviously as a studio, we build now different world on a different platform, on different platform. And so how do you how do you navigate all these worlds? So talking of, not from a technological point of view, but from the point of view of the, the visitor and the user, how can these jump from one world to the to the other? So we, yeah, we're working on, on a project like this. And, and yeah, physically, you can just walk around and you have this portal, and you just pass through the portal, and straight away you get into the other world, whatever it is on Frame VR or Hubs or um, Cyber, uh, whatever. Cyber, what is it? The other one? Cyber. Um, what's the uh, Cyber? On, on Cyber, that's another VR platform. Um, because, yeah, they ask, like, like, every week I find a new VR platform these days, so <laughs> what are people doing? What are developers are thinking to reinvent so many? So many times the wheel. Uh, so that, yeah, that's something I'm pondering with, and maybe we'll we'll find some some way to avoid this waste of energy. <laughs> <laughs> hey, um, now there's some incredible new tech advancements coming out recently, and I uh, almost can't keep up with all of them. <laughs> it's really incredible. I've most recently, what I'm really inspired by has been the transparent OLED TVs, you know, and a lot of these advancements in tech start out at, you know, commercial levels, but I think that there's a lot of potential for creative purposes, and um, i just love to see um, this new technology get into the hands of, like, creators and be more accessible to artistic people. Um, I think probably the greatest technology advancement that's come out are the new graphics cards and CPUs, because um, I know for Looking Glass, like, you definitely need a pretty good computer to create um, a level of content. You know, it's not necessary for just creating anything, but um, yeah, the more powerful of a computer you have, it just unlocks so much potential and so many doors. And, once that becomes more commonplace, you know, and individuals have more access to them, maybe within our laptops even, then that expands the potential for rendered content, live content, web content, all of it. And yeah, I think that's the most exciting to me, <laughs> for sure. Uh, so Dario said something uh, everyone is a creator. That really resonates with me. And, and it reminds me of a couple things. One, I, I think this is something that social media platforms got extremely right with saying everyone is a journalist, everyone is a blogger, everybody is a photographer. Um, and I think that uh, Unity 3D, I don't know if they still do, but they used to have a lot of messaging around uh, what they were doing was not uh, building a game engine, they were building an interactive authoring suite because everyone was going to be an interactive uh, experience author. And um, what I still remember, like the first game I ever made was text only. You had to use your keyboard and it was rock, paper, scissors. Mm -hmm. And the second game I tried to make was in Unity 3D. It was going to be a hyper-realistic, full 3D, custom hardware to track the hands, virtual multiplayer experience. Um, and I didn't get very far. Um, I, I ran pretty quickly into the limitations of my time and skill and know-how. Um, and I think what I'm most excited about is seeing what happens when you give 
people who maybe don't have as much 3D experience as you all do, the tools to say, you want to decorate this wall with some 2D media, whether that's videos or, or graphics, you want to pull in 3D models from around the world, or, uh, or sorry, from around the internet, or um, increasingly people are going to have 3D scanners in their pocket, and they're going to scan something in front of them and clean it up a little bit and then plop it into their virtual world and share it. Um, I think that with Unity, they've gone down the path of being a general purpose experience engine. You can build first-person shooter games, you can build advertisements that run on the side of web pages, you can build 2D platformers, and it's very, very flexible, it gives a high level of control. With hubs, we're kind of taking a different approach, similar to how Unreal Engine started before it became the general purpose game engine that it, that it is now. Unreal Engine started with being the engine behind Unreal Tournament, a first-person shooter, really fast-paced, very uh, lots of action. And what they did was they let people who really liked the game just modify some of the files that changed the colors of the, some of the, the weapons or the special effects. And over time, people made little tweaks and plugins and add-ons. And that, that, like, you know, not totally game development world, just people kind of tweaking images and files on their system uh, turned into what is now the, one of the most successful game engines on the planet, Unreal Engine. Uh, so, for, for me, the, the thing that excites me about the space, and this is very you know, self-serving because I work on hubs, is with hubs, we're trying to make this bet that a lot of people are going to want a multiplayer experience. They want it to run wherever their friends have their computers. They want to be able to click a link and get in. They don't want to have to convince their friend to download my you know, little app that could from the web store uh, or from, from an app store. And um, I, we've already started to see people who have no game development experience, no you know, 3D modeling experience, throw you know, 50 models of dinosaurs and all of their favorite YouTube videos about dinosaurs. I'm thinking specifically of a, a, an 11 year old I saw in an education, like in a classroom environment. Um, by the way, all of the performance problems that people mentioned absolutely tanked the experience. He was like, what? Why can't, you know, what's going on? It's rendering at five FPS and he didn't care at all. He's like, this is amazing. You know, I've made my dinosaur world. Um, and so I think that trend of everyone being creators is like the number one thing that excites me about all this technology. Awesome. So it sounds like there's a pretty common theme across everyone on the panel that kind of democratization of these technologies is a good thing. And like getting these technologies um, in the hands of folks like our audience is, is what's super critical for the future. Kind of following with that trend, um, I'd like to give a round of applause for our panelists. <laughs>